So today I'm going to be presenting to you on locating a microseismic event using deconvolution. And what I'd like to start off with is looking at both time reversal and deconvolution method and explain why we started applying it towards microseismic imaging. So time reversal has been the focus of much research due to its ability to compress a wavefront at a point in both space and time. This has led to a wide variety of applications such as communication, non-invasive surgery, seismology, and non-destructive evaluation. Now the problem though with time reversal, as Farhad was pointing out during his presentation, is that it's not able to reconstruct a true Dirac delta function in uh, real experiments due to certain conditions not upholding. Such as if for it to work perfectly, you need to have no attenuation in your medium, you need to be able to record infinite bandwidth, and you need to have full coverage of your wave field. And these things obviously don't always happen. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to look towards a simple method that's fast and doesn't have a significant increase in cost that we could use to improve this focusing. <coughs> so what we started to look into is just something simple, deconvolution. So what we stated was that we had a signal recorded at receivers, R of T, convolved with G of T, our deconvolved signal that we're going to solve for is approximately equal to a Dirac delta function. And when we bring this to the frequency domain, this purely becomes a multiplication, and your direct delta function becomes 1. So solving this for a g omega, one gets the following result, where we've added a stabilization constant, epsilon, in our denominator for those scenarios where the denominator could equal 0, and then numerator you have the complex conjugate. So now that we've kind of shown to you this method, and what I want to reiterate to you, this is all done in this temporal domain, and then brought over to the frequency domain. It's created to improve the temporal focusing. That was the goal of this method. So let's see if we achieve that. So what we first started with was we did a joint project with Los Alamos National Laboratory. We had the following experimental setup. We first started off with an irregularly shaped aluminum sample of approximately 1,000 cubic centimeters. We then did a reciprocal time reversal experiment. Why did we do that? Well, we had a res um, our source be a transducer and our receiver was a laser vibrometer, not just a transducer. The downside to that is, is that the laser vibrometer cannot be used as both a receiver and source. <laughs> the benefit of it, though, was that we could use it to scan around our source location at the time of focus to look at the spatial focus of both methods as well. And this was an ultrasound experiment with a frequency of 200 kilohertz of our source impulse. So, we would emit our source impulse through that irregularly shaped aluminum sample, record it, and then apply both methods to get the following calculated backpropagating signals. On the top panel, represented in blue, you see our time reversal backpropagating signal. On the bottom, our deconvolved uh, signal that we calculated. And what's important to know in this figure is that for the deconvolution, after approximately 1.64 milliseconds, you'll notice a causal feature. And what we discovered running um, in the lab different experiments is that if we calculated the signal here, but then we just suddenly set that arbitrarily equal to zero, we'd still get a focus, it just would not be symmetric. So this was crucial to still having this information. So now once we've calculated these backpropagating signals, we then emit them back into our medium and look at how the temporal focus is compared with both methods. And so in this figure, the black represents our original source impulse. That's what we would hope to reconstruct with our temporal focus. Red is the temporal focus we achieved using deconvolution, and blue is the temporal focus we achieved using time reversal. Now there's two key um, points to note in this figure. First off, you note that these um, time reversals, temporal focus, has these significant side lobes present, whereas deconvolution does not. Due to that, Deconvolution is able to reconstruct that original source impulse a lot better than time reversal. So we want to quantify this. And what we did was we created a window around the time of focus where we had 100% of the energy in that window for the original source impulse. We then looked into how much energy was in that window for deconvolution and time reversal. What we discovered with this image, just purely this image, we saw that 70% of the energy was in that window for deconvolution but only 15% for time reversal due to those significant side lobes being there. We then rerun our experiment for multiple transducers to see if deconvolution is consistently better than time reversal 
and its ability to temporally focus. And what we discovered was that even increasing the amount of transducers, deconvolution stayed consistently better than time reversal. And we'll note here with the one transducer, that was the figures I was just previously showing you, with the 70% and approximately 15%. So you'd say, okay, we're done. You know, we've achieved our goal. But we went a little bit further and we found out something extra that kind of came to a surprise to us at first. So we looked at the spatial focusing. And it'll be a little bit hard to see in this figure, but what you note around this focus is this fringe-like pattern that isn't focusing at the time of focus. And this is done by using that laser fibrometer to scan a 5 centimeter by 5 centimeter region around that focus. And due to this being a little bit hard to see, we just did the same thing for deconvolution. I normalized them and subtracted one from the other just to show the difference between the two spatial focuses. And this is what we got. So now you'll clearly see those fringe-like patterns jump out at you where um, time reversal is not able to compress all these wave fronts at the time of focus at that source location. So why does this happen? Well, it, we've kind of created a theory for it so far, and you can see it in our CWP report as well um, on our microseismic. Um, so if you're interested, have a look at that. But this came to us as a surprise because, like I stated earlier, deconvolution was created to improve temporal focusing. It was done in the temporal domain. So, um, so then we re-ran the experiment, again, with multiple transducers as well, and compared to spatial focus. Now there's something important to point out in this figure, which is that the difference between deconvolution and time reversal's ability to improve the spatial focusing is not as significant as in the temporal focus. Now the difference we got to approximately 7% or less. Whereas, you know, with the temporal focusing, we had the 70% and 15%. Now we're looking between 87, 89, and, and 83. So let's quickly summarize what we've learned from our experiment that we did with Los Alamos. Well, we learned that this deconvolution method, it's simple and it's fast, and it did not only improve temporal focusing, but also spatial focusing. And it requires only the received signal to calculate that backpropagating signal and to, um, to get the focusing. So, due to us discovering that it improved the spatial focusing as well, we were keen on trying to apply it to microseismic imaging to see if we can improve the locating of microseismic events. So the first thing we did was we did it for acoustic modeling. We had the following setup. We had a, the, the following uh, correctivized model with horizontally continuous layers with velocities between 5 and 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. We then had 56 receivers divided evenly between two vertical boreholes, 28 on each side, represented by the red plus sign. We then had one source located at the yellow dot. So we'd emit our source wave field from our source location into our correct velocity model and propagate it, recording it at our receivers. We then add bandpass limited noise to our recorded signals to try and make it a little bit more realistic. But we added one more complexity to it. For uh, the medium that we would back propagate it through, we wouldn't back propagate it through the correct velocity model. We would back propagate it through a smooth velocity model where the mean slowness in the vertical direction was the same of both velocity models. And so we would record it at the bandpass limited noise, apply both methods, and then back propagating through the smooth velocity model. So let's see how the spatial focus is compared. So this is the spatial focus that we achieved using time reversal. Now what's important to see here is that the yellow arrow is pointing towards this wavefront that isn't compressing at the time of focus using time reversal. And this is something we were seeing as well in the laboratory in our experiments. We then did the same setup for deconvolution, and we got the following result. Trying to remove that uncompressed wavefront uh, using deconvolution instead of time reversal. And again, just like we were seeing in that um, Los Alamos experiment. So if for any reason you weren't able to see that well, we then created cross-sectional views of these images. And we also showed a, a 1D profile of the temporal focus. So in the top panels here, you'll see that um, deconvolution was able to tr is trying to compress that temporal focus into one single peak, whereas time reversal still has these, this two-peak um, temporal focus. When you then look at that spatial focus cross-section, um, you can see how deconvolution is trying to improve that spatial focus significantly better than time reversal. So 
we've now just shown that we were able to improve the spatial focus and therefore the, um, the microseismic event locating using um, deconvolution compared to time reversal in the acoustic scenario. What we then wanted to do was we wanted to see if we could have retrieved more information from the source um, by using this method. And so we started to looking towards elastic modeling. And for our elastic modeling, we did the analysis for three different types of sources, horizontal and vertical point forces, and double couple. Now, um, the double couple work, we have not finished yet, so just be presenting on the horizontal and vertical point forces. So for this, we used the exact same setup as in our acoustic modeling. We had those horizontally continuous layers, and we used the same p-velocities as in our acoustic scenario. For S-wave velocities, we just used half of the p-wave. We had the same array geometry and the same amount of receivers and source locations. And so let's first look at the horizontal point force. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to see if we could improve the reconstruction of the radiation pattern using deconvolution instead of time reversal, thus decomposing it into P and S components and seeing that reconstruction. So at the time of emissions, due to a horizontal point force, the S component has the following radiation pattern. What's important to note with this radiation pattern is that you have a nodal line intersecting your receivers. And we found something interesting about having the nodal line intersecting our receivers. So, for the spatial focus using time reversal now, we had the following result. And so, we were able to reconstruct that radiation pattern well uh, using time reversal. Using deconvolution, we were able to reconstruct that radiation pattern as well. And so, there was no significant improvement between the two methods for this S component radiation pattern due to a horizontal point force. And we believe this has to do somewhat with that nodal line intersecting our receivers. Because if we go to our P component now, um, due to a horizontal point force, we now have a nodal line running parallel to our receivers and not intersecting our receivers anymore. So we're intrigued to see how um, both methods compared in trying to reconstruct this radiation pattern. So using time reversal now, we had the following um, reconstruction of the radiation pattern, the spatial focus. And we saw the same similar thing again, where we had that wavefront that wasn't compressing at the time of focus using time reversal. Due to that, we were not able um, to retrieve very nicely the radiation pattern of this image. If one was given this image, it would be very hard to see um, that radiation pattern for the P component. However, using deconvolution, we are able to compress that wavefront, so it seems, at the time of focus, at that source location, thus reconstructing that radiation pattern um, better. So let's have a quick look as I slide through them. So here's the deconvolution. Here's time reversal. Deconvolution, and just to show you the original. So the original, deconvolution, time reversal, deconvolution, and the original. So if for any reason you were not able to see that well, we then created cross-sectional views of these images um, to see it more in 1D. And this is uh, what, we, we, what we saw. So in the top panel, you know, that deconvolution had that significant improvement in reconstructing that peak trough focus of that radiation pattern. Whereas time reversal, we were not able to get that. However, on that S component, at that same time, at the time of focus, we were able to, with even time reversal, to get that reconstruction of the radiation pattern. So there was no significant improvement for the S component, but there was for the P component. And again, we believe that due to be, having that nodal line intersecting our receivers, for the uh, P components, radi uh, for the S components radiation pattern, but the nodal line running parallel to our receivers for the P component. So then we did the same analysis for a vertical point force. We're just going to rotate our source 90 degrees and thus rotating our radiation patterns as well. And so now we'd hope to see um, um, kind of everything switched because the radiation patterns will switch uh, um, orientation. So now for the vertical point force, the S component will not have a nodal line intersecting our receivers, but rather running parallel to our receivers. And so we would hope to see an improvement for the reconstruction of the S component um, using deconvolution. So using time reversal, we had the following reconstruction of that radiation pattern using time reversal. And that yellow arrow is indicating again that wavefront that isn't compressing at that time of focus at the source location. So again, it's very hard to see from this figure um, what that radiation pattern due to the source would be. 
However, using deconvolution, we're able to get it a lot cleaner um, by removing that wave front, um, um, by removing that wave front, and thus reconstructing it significantly better. So now going towards the S component. Uh, so sorry, this was the original one. Just quickly go through it again. Deconvolution, time reversal. Deconvolution, time reversal. Deconvolution and the original. So now we did the same for the P component. And so we'd hope to see no significant improvement for the P component because now we have that nodal line intersecting our receivers. So this is what, the, um, what we got using time reversal. And so you'll see that um, even though it's not perfect, we are able to retrieve that um, radiation pattern using time reversal for the P component. Using deconvolution, you also get that reconstruction of the radiation pattern. So our prediction was right. We, were able, uh, there, we saw no significant improvement between both methods um, for the P component due to a vertical point, um, point force. So let me just slide through it real quick. So time reversal, deconvolution, time reversal, deconvolution. And so we did this um, cross-sectional views of these images again, um, just to see it more clearly. And what you'll note in these top panels for the P components is that, again, we see that no significant improvement using deconvolution compared to time reversal and trying to reconstruct the radiation pattern of the P component. However, for the S component on the bottom panels, you note that deconvolution is um, significantly better in reconstructing that um, trough peak focus of that radiation pattern due to the S component, whereas time reversal was not. So what can we conclude about deconvolution? Well, we've, we've shown so far that for our acoustic modeling, uh, we improved both temporal and spatial focusing. And then when, when, when we went towards our elastic modeling, we saw that it improved the reconstruction of the radiation pattern compared to time reversal. And finally, what I want to point out again is this method has no um, significant increase in cost compared to cost of processing this microseismic imaging. It's, it's just as simple as fast as time reversal. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory um, for doing the joint project with us. Um, you all the consortium sponsors for helping sponsor this project. And finally, the CWP faculty and students for helping out during any uh, problems and uh, questions I always had. So, thank you.